for the moms who raised us up, gave us hope, and made us strong. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who had to figure out how to do this on their own. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the hurting moms who've loved and lost but never given up. For the praying moms who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the working moms, the stay home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For teaching us how to walk and how to make a difference. For the late night snuggles and the early morning pancakes. For sitting with us after our first breakup. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you. We thank you. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Ashley Ridge Church online this week. Maybe you're getting used to this. I hope that you've enjoyed seeing my face on Sundays and Nancy on Wednesdays and Lee on Fridays. But regardless of where you're watching from, whether you are here local in Somerville or if you're in another part of the country or maybe even the world, we are glad that you're here. Hey, good news. We finally got a building, right? Isn't this great? Uh, we are on site this week at Somerville Baptist uh, downtown. They were nice enough to uh, let us come in and do some shooting here this week. This is the church I grew up in, so uh, mad props to them. Thank you guys so much. Here's what I want you to do. If you're sitting and watching in church online right now, pull out your phone, and I want you to text the link live.ashleyridgechurch.org and invite someone to come join you for the rest of the service right now. Take out your phone, text a friend that you've been meaning to invite to church, send them the link, say, hey, come watch with me. If you're watching on Facebook, click the share button right here or start a watch party. Invite some of your friends and interact with them in the chat. We want to share this message of hope with as many people as possible. And what a great vehicle to do it right now. You can literally invite anyone in the world to church with you right now. So go ahead and do that. Make that happen. Speaking of, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be singing a few songs here in just a minute, and then Pastor Jen's going to come, and we're going to continue our series in the meantime, where we talk about what to do when we don't really know what to do, and we're kind of in a phase of waiting. So uh, if you want to join with us, if this is your home church, and you want to partner with us financially to impact uh, the things we're doing here locally in Somerville and all over the place. That information's right here. You can send us a check the old-fashioned way or text any amount to 84321. Also visit us on our website or in our app to do that. And we thank you so much for the work that you're continuing to uh, make possible uh, with your generous giving. So hang tight, sit back, relax, fill up your coffee. It's time for us to do some singing. We're so glad you're here. It's Ashley Ridge Online. The reason, hallelujah, in the presence of my enemies, and I'll raise a hallelujah.
So what do you do when there's nothing you can do? It's a question we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now, and it's also a question we've been bumping up against in significant ways in recent weeks. That feeling of not being able to do so many things that we want to do, and then really getting in these tight spots, these frustration spots, even these anger spots, when we don't know what to do because there's so many things that we simply can't do. And here's the thing, while we've been talking about this and in light of these days online, while we're socially distanced, these are actually questions that are really important for us throughout life. In fact, one of the things I've been discovering in the midst um, just in the last few weeks is that a lot of what we're talking about are some foundational pieces and foundational ideas of the Christian faith. Two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that you don't have to understand in order to obey. And man, that's an uncomfortable statement if ever I've heard one. In fact, I hope that you just didn't take it and run with it that week. Maybe you've wrestled with it a little bit, or maybe some of you have an 11-year-old in your house like mine who told me he just didn't like it. And, and that is so much of our inclination. We want to understand. We want the answers. It feels better when we know. But we don't have to understand to obey. And when we believe in the one who gave up his son, who gave up everything for us, we move to that place. That's why it's such a central idea to the Christian faith. But then last week, we followed up with this discussion of while we're in this place of waiting and we can't do so many of the things that we want to do, we can, we can be obedient, but sometimes we don't even know where to go with that. And we talked about the idea that we need to look for God, that we don't need his protection and his preservation nearly as much as we simply need his presence. And so one of the things I challenged y'all to do is go after his presence. And I hope that maybe you've done that. I, I reorganized our family schedule for the 8,000th time that in the recent weeks to make sure that there was an hour every morning after everyone was actually awake where we could simply spend time with God. Because when we spend time with God, the truth is we don't always understand it. We don't always know how to talk to God. We don't know how to feel God in all these places. But the, the mystery of the Christian faith is that when we find ourselves in the presence of God, and we don't have to look very far, right? He says he's going to be right there. We just have to ask and show up. But when we find ourselves in the presence of God, so much of the rest starts to look very different. Well, today I want to take us another step down this road as we ask the question of what do you do when there's nothing you can do? And in order to do that, I want to talk about the worst kept secret ever. 
Do y'all know what the worst kept secret ever is? It's actually different for all of us, but the worst kept secret is that there are things that you can't do. There are things that I can't do. Now, the reason this is a terribly kept secret is we allow ourselves to live under the illusion that that we can do all of these things. And if we can't do it, we fake it and we hope that everyone else thinks that we've got it under control, right? Some of y'all been playing a strong game lately of all these projects you're getting done around your house. Stop it. All right. Some of you are. And that's awesome. I am joking with you, sort of, Um, because... For a lot of us, we're not. And even if there wasn't a global health pandemic keeping us at home, we wouldn't be either because I'm not very good with tools. In fact, my husband and I, neither of us really excel at the, the DIY realm. And so we watch friends that are putting up shiplap and doing other fun things. And we kind of look at each other and we're like, wouldn't that be cool? And and we don't really know how to walk down that road. But see, the funny thing is, we all have things that we know we can't do. And some of them we laugh openly about. But there's also a lot of things that we can't do that we do try to convince other people that we can do. And it's a terribly kept secret because there is nobody fooled about so many of the things that you're working so hard trying to convince them that you can do. You can keep your life in perfect order really? Because if so, then you need to share a little bit more with the rest of us. This can be a fun exercise too. Y'all, um, I, I used to watch American Idol and I know it's back on and they're doing creative things even, but I haven't watched it in years and years and years. Um, even the last few years it was on in the last run, but used to watch the show and in the early days they would bring everybody in for the auditions. And you know, I mean, it was all produced and everything else, but you'd have the people that came in and they'd do all the interviews about how everybody always told them that they were an amazing singer and then you get into the actual audition and you just want to die on their behalf because they cannot sing. And now this secret has been exposed to the whole world. And you ask yourself, like, did they really not know that they couldn't sing? One of the other things that I can't do is I can't craft. And every now and then I try to pretend as though I can and my friends get to sit around and laugh at me because it's not a secret to them when they see me do things with glue sticks or glue guns or I don't even know the difference that I can't actually do it. Some of you think you can dance and your friends need to tell you otherwise. Some of you think that you can run a 40 as fast as you ran a 40 when you were in high school. And chances are, for some of you, that simply isn't the case anymore. You can't do that. But we spend a lot of time trying to convince the world and ourselves of the things that we can do. Now, it's funny when it's things like crafting or DIY or whatever, But when it's all of the parts that we feel like we're supposed to be able to do or the things that we think we should be getting right by now or the things that we wish we had under control, we run into these moments where we realize that we we don't have it all together as we'd like. And I've said this in the last few weeks too, one of the things that's happening right now is we're exposing a lot of things that were already present. They're just rising to the surface in this time. And when we run into these places where we were maybe running and working and trying hard enough and pushing hard enough and filling our calendars enough to to think that we could do it all. And then we run into this place where we realize how much we can't. What can happen is we can start to disintegrate or we start to hide or maybe we even we let our discontentment start to drive us in all kinds of sideways and self-destructive directions. Let me stay here for a minute with you in case you're wondering if you've ever walked this path. I think we all have. Discontentment, when we feel like we can't do the things that we wish we could do and have been trying to do. 
It can lead us into this long-term path of these self-destructive regrets when we run into the idea of, I'm tired of waiting for, and so I'm just going to. Or what about this one? The pressure is too much. So instead, fill in the blank. Or what about this one that's so pervasive in our culture? I deserve to be happy and I'm not. So instead, do you recognize any of these places that our discontentment can drive us? Our discontentment with what we can't do or what we feel like we should be able to do can push us into these holes and into these places where if we're not careful, we can make some seriously bad decisions that have long-term consequences. And so I just wanna be really honest together today in this time that there are actually a whole lot of things that we can't do. We were not made, built, or intended to do it all or to have it all. Isn't that interesting? But we wrestle with that because we want that. And some of us, you know, we really want it, even for good reasons. We want it for our kids. We want it for the people we love and we care about. But we run into these truths of the fact that we can't have it all and we can't do it all. And there's this big thing that just sits over our shoulders, hovers over our head, and it's called discontentment. Well, here's some good news. I know you were starting to worry that I wasn't going to get there. I am. Because while the worst kept secret is that you can't do some of the things you've been trying to convince the world that you can, there is, in fact, a secret that often gets pushed aside and, and ignored and hidden that is actually one of the very best secrets of all time. And it's a secret that Paul stumbled upon in his lifetime. Paul comes on the scene kind of in the middle of the, the New Testament story where we've heard from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about all this time that they got to spend with Jesus and talk with Jesus and the things that he shared with them. But Paul grows up a Jew and, and gets to a point in his life where he is, he calls himself a Jew among the Jews, a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He studied everything. He's learned everything. There is nothing that he feels like he can't do until one day on a road to Damascus, he meets Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. He meets Jesus and the first thing that happens to him is that he goes blind. Because if he was in any doubt in this moment of how his life was about to change so completely, God was taking that off the table. He was like, you could see, and now you can't. So let's deal right now with the fact that there are some things that you cannot do on your own. In fact, the first thing that Saul was told that he had to do was he was going to have to go find a friend who was going to be able to help him, heal him, get him to the other side of this blindness. And so Paul begins a journey at a very dramatic place where he starts to discover that Jesus was in fact who he said he was. And these people that were following Jesus weren't just rebels without a cause. They actually had the best cause ever because Jesus was who he said he was, right? We spent weeks talking about these bystander accounts and all of the evidence we had that Jesus is who he says, and now Paul runs into this story in a very dramatic fashion and he sets about trying to help others understand it. And in the process, he starts to run into some of his own inadequacies. He starts to run into all the things that he maybe thought he knew, but he didn't know. He starts to live very um, kind of central to the story of what it was gonna mean for the church, for followers of Jesus to live in the meantime. 
In the meantime of when Jesus came and said, I've forgiven you, I've made a way to the Father, I've made things new, and I'm coming again to take you to where I am. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I need you to trust my spirit who I'm sending with you. I need you to go and be my witnesses. I need you to love. I need you to serve. I need you to sacrifice. And there's some things that you're going to learn along the way. And Paul becomes one of the primary spokes, spokesmen, I guess, for lack of a better word, of what this looks like. But one of the things that Paul stumbles upon at, at some point in his ministry is what he called the secret to contentment. And it wasn't at the point of his ministry where he realized that he had it all figured out and he understood everything and he had put everything in place and he had learned to not sin. In fact, he told us he never figured that part out. He said he wanted to stop sinning, but he couldn't stop sinning. Um, that might sound like some of y'all, right? Didn't come when he got his life in order and had all the right relationships and all of the pieces in place. In fact, he never had all the relationships and he often found himself in jail and in trouble. And yet he stumbles upon the secret to contentment and he shares it in a letter that he writes to the Philippians. And he's writing them this letter and often it's actually called one of Paul's love letters. Unlike some of his other letters where he's just reaming everybody out and yelling at them about all the stuff that they're confusing and missing about this gospel message. He writes a letter to the Philippians who he actually was able to spend a lot of time with. And it's a very compassionate letter. It's a very, it's very much a letter that I think we would all like to get right now because right now none of us needs to be yelled at, <laughs> right? We're all yelling at each other enough. He, he sends them that letter that we all need that says, you know what? You're doing all right. Stick with what you know. Keep pursuing God, right? He's telling them all these things, but then he gets to a point towards the end of his letter and he says this to him and it's so central to our faith. I'm in Philippians 4, starting in verse 10. He says this, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. So again, right there, what we find out is that not everybody's always been concerned about him. Paul's had some seasons where he was lonely. He's had some seasons where he was frustrated. He had seasons where he didn't know why people had forgotten about him. But here he says, I rejoiced greatly that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it, right? A lot of times that's the case. People are, you know, thinking about us. We just don't know they're thinking about us. And we've already convinced ourselves that we're on our own. But he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content. There it is. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And, and before we dismiss him as someone who doesn't get what we get or not living what we've lived or understanding what we're dealing with, he says, I know what it is to be in need. And I also know what it is to have plenty. But I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Are you ready? Are you ready? At this point, you ought to be leaning in from whatever comfortable seating in your living room that you might be in right now. Put your coffee cup down. He says, I've learned the secret. And, and it's not about the circumstances. It's not about making things better. It's not about the perfect protein shake. I've been working on that too in these days. But he says, it's not those things. Here it is. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. To say that differently, and I know last week I was encouraging us to maybe memorize some scripture in these days, but some of you may have memorized this one growing up. It is a classic that if you grew up in church was probably in front of you. Later manuscripts changed a couple of those words from what I just read and what you likely memorized and what I memorized as a child was I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens me. Now, the problem is that when we memorize that verse on its own, we tend to key into the part that says, I can do all things. It, it starts to convince us, and, and maybe I'm being too personal here, come along with me, that we can do it all. It says it right there in the Bible. We found a verse. I can do it all. If I just work hard enough, if I just try hard enough, if I just run fast enough, if I just all the things enough enough, then I can fix all of it. And then we run right into this season. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Because here's the deal. You can't. God can. I can't. God can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And you have to keep that in context where it doesn't depend on your circumstances. Whatever is the word that Paul used, and I love that. I love that. He uses it again later in this letter. He says, whatever is good and whatever is right and whatever is praiseworthy, think on these things. I love that he uses the word whatever because I got a whole lot of whatevers these days. But Paul says, whatever your circumstances, you can be content. But it's about understanding that you can't and God can. But that's not actually, that's, that's almost the whole story. That's almost the secret, except that we could get real stuck on this can't and can business. And so I want to say it for you this way. This is it. This is the secret. This isn't the worst kept secret. That's about how I craft, right? This is the secret to contentment. Christ is in me. I have everything I need. If Christ is in me and he said he would be, if Christ is in me and he died so he could be, if Christ is in me, if Christ is in you, you have everything you need. And for all the things that you feel like you can't do, that you want to do, that you can't control, that you don't have within your grasp, Jesus says, you know what? In the meantime, it's a really good chance for me to show you again and again that if you have me, you've got it all. And the gift of Christ in us is a gift that the world doesn't give and it certainly can't take away. And so y'all, some of you just need to hear me say that to you today. You can't. You've been trying. You can't. You've run into some walls of discontentment. You've made some bad decisions because of it. You can't have it all. You can't do it all. But for all the things that you can't, God can. And your heavenly father, the one who can, moved heaven and earth because he could so that he could live inside of us. So that our can'ts actually become possibilities in the hands of God. It was also Paul who said, so I'm going to rejoice in my weaknesses. Ha! <laughs> I'm excelling at that one. Not at all. But Paul said, I've actually learned to be okay with my weaknesses because where I'm weak, he is strong. Stop trying to pretend that you can do it all. 
the foundation of the Christian faith stands on the feet of Jesus who says, you don't have to, I did it for you. Christ is in me. I have everything I need. Let's pray. God, I know there are just so many of us out there that are done and we're tired and we're frustrated and we're trying to refocus and we get back up and then we get pushed down. And God, we simply need a reminder from you today that you are with us, that you are around us, that you are in us, that you are for us. And that if that is true, and God, we believe it's true. And some people I know are grasping for that faith, but you said if we had a mustard seed's worth, that that was gonna be enough. And so God, we are holding on to that in this moment, that if you are with us, we already have everything we need. And so God, for all the things that we are waiting to be different, for all of the things that we are praying about, and God, we're gonna to continue to pray that you would get rid of this virus. We're gonna to continue to pray that people who are sick would be made well. We're gonna to continue to pray that you would watch over us, that you would protect us, that you would teach us what it is to love our neighbors in times like this. But God, as we continue to pray for all of those things, we're also going to spend time being grateful that we already have everything we will ever need, and it's you. God, would you please write your contentment on all of our hearts today? Would you please tap us on the shoulder in the minutes and the, the hours when everything starts to grow around us? And tell us again that there are things that we can't, but you can. And you are the one who is in us and for us. And so, Heavenly Father, we trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with our families. We trust you with our communities. We trust you with these days. Will you do in them whatever it is you desire? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, everybody, thanks for joining us today. A couple quick things before you go. Don't forget that you can let us know any prayer request or any needs you might have and connect with us via our Connect card. You can find that in the Ashley Ridge app or also uh, if you're in church online in the top toolbar, or you can just simply type in cc.ashleyridgechurch.org and you'll get that. The other thing is that all of the various ways to give are available all week long. You can give 24 seven via our app, via text to give, um, via our website, ashleyridgechurch.org slash give, or you can mail us a check the good old fashioned way. We hope you'll engage with us throughout the week on our social media platforms, also at ashleyridgechurch.org. We're gonna continue to provide great content and uh, programming, and most importantly, connection uh, to others. So if you haven't yet jumped in a small group, you can jump in virtually. Just visit our website there too. And we can't wait to see you in the ways that we can see you this week. We'll see you soon.